I've been avoiding reading The Wheel of Time for years now and I've just read it and I really need to talk about it because there are so many red flags. It's a little bit of a mess and I think I'm kind of obsessed with it. And let's start with how everyone was telling me to read it. You're gonna love it, they said. It is a masterpiece, they said. What no one told me is that it had major issues with the pacing, with the character, with how the plot ends, how descriptive it ends, the messiest part of the middle, how many ins we're gonna be following. But again, I kind of liked it and I really want to continue. So if by the end of this video you can feel how messy this book was but still feel that this is something interesting, please let me know because I will feel fulfilled as a human. But wait a second, if I've been reading fantasy all of my life, how come that I've never wanted to read Wheel of Time? Well, first of all, it's such a high commitment it's not only that there's 14 books, which in itself makes it huge, but there's also so many words. There's out there this amazing graphs where you see that the whole Wheel of Time has 4.4 million words, which are a lot. And if you compare that with A Song of Ice and Fire, with the five books that we have right now, that is 1.7 million words. And with Harry Potter as a whole, it's 1 million. We're talking about 4.4, but if you're able to move past that, you will also get to know that a lot of people tell you that the middle books are kind of a slow, that are a little bit of a letdown, and it just feels like, okay, how and why would I spend that much time reading something if in the middle there's something that I won't really like? But also, just for pure coincidence, when I was young, I read mostly my father's fantasy collection, and he was never one for reading longer series. So I somewhat went from Dragonlance to then my own collection, where I started with the dark materials with Aragorn and you know Sanderson eventually and I never came back so I completely missed that wave and everything is all very scary because there are die-hard fans out there it is outstanding and it's actually one of the best things that I'm extracting from this reading like okay yes it really scared me to read it and not like it and then feel like I was really outside from the fantasy community but at the same time when I started sharing that I was gonna read this everyone started writing me it felt very very supportive and it's one of the best things that I can say but then why now and uh yeah, I got it recommended time and time and time again. And I thought, okay, sometime it needs to be time. And I was recently on holidays and I was like, yeah, this is the moment. It's not gonna get better. Also, it's within the top list of lots of booktubers that I really admire that it feels that I was gonna like it in a way. And yeah, also TV series made me really want to read it. Not because I felt that it was fantastic, but because the premise sound fascinating. I kind of saw the potential of the ace and I the growing up trope with the chosen one, the quest, you know, all of those vibes felt fantastic to me. Also, up to this point, I'm like, okay, I want to continue watching this TV series, but I don't want to spoil myself much, so I need to keep reading because this will take a long. But what's this story about? Well, first, it starts with the best prologue that you will probably read. It feels very high stakes. It talks about this dark one having this massive fight with this man who this dark one keeps calling dragon. And immediately we'll get to know that there's a fight that has been happening time and time again. Somewhat the time it's being replicated you will move in cycles and the dark one has always won and you were seeing how this last time this dark one also defeats the good one and with that you get to see a little bit of explanation of how this world works because the wheel weaves as the wheel wills the wheel wheels at the wheel weaves no no and let me tell you a quote of this amazing fight between good and evil you and I have fought a thousand battles with the turning of the wheel, a thousand times a thousand, and we will fight until time dies and the shadow is triumphant. Very cool. It seems that in this world, the wheel of time, it's always moving. And every time that it moves, there are different ages. And these ages comes and goes. It's always the same kind of story. And it's just that the story repeats itself. And now it seems to be at the beginning of a new age. And when I read that I was like okay damn it tell me more it was fantastic it felt 
Again, high stakes, classic fantasy with the good one, the bad one. I was all for it. And then we kind of start a first chapter that it's also very strong, but that right off the bat started with one of the main red flags for me that I wasn't aware, but it seems that if you know a little bit for Wheel of Time, like everyone knows it, which we'll get to see that. We will start with this dark figure that it's riding a horse and he is hidden. Is it an Asgul? Kind of. He is watching this different characters, but we will start with one of the main points of view, who is kind of like the main character in this story, who is Rand. And we will see Rand, who is this farm boy with this red hair, and he is very naive, and I have a somewhat complicated relationship with him. I don't know if we like him or not. And basically, he's there with his dad. They are all getting ready for this party that is going to happen, this festival that is about to happen. And he just crosses eyes with this rider and he gets terrified. He feels anger, he feels fear, and he is like, something is not good here. And the thing is that Ran and his father Tam, they will go to the village and he talks with his best friend. In one hand we will have Matt, who is a little bit of a mischievous kind of person. He is always doing bad things. And then we have Perrin, who is a little bit more serious. And I hate Perrin. It seems that the three of them have seen this weird figure and everything. It's very suspicious. But also you will get to see that this is all very Lord of the Rings inspired. And I mean very. Doesn't it sound really as we are the hobbits in the Shire. We are waiting for Gandalf to come. In this case we have the Gleeman. He brings these fireworks for the celebration. In that case Bilbo's birthday. So it's kind of like yeah it feels the same. But at that point I was like okay well I mean yeah, coincidences, I guess. This is not a coincidence, though. This was made kind of like an homage. This book was published in a moment in which Lord of the Rings was over there. And I reckon this was something that was needed in order for other books within the fantasy genre to be published. But the, it is very, very, very similar. This is not the end of all of the references that I will be sharing throughout this story, because I will be sharing all. Anyway, we keep knowing different characters here. The Gleeman that I was talking about, the one with the fireworks, he's kind of like the entertainer. It is a very unique kind of role within this land. There are not many. There are kind of like the bards in a way and his name is Thom. Now I kind of really enjoyed him and I think he's such a great figure although it has some comments that were really sexist which is also one of the red flags that I saw in this book that mainly there's a lot of discussion around well women and it is something really interesting because in this world the magic it kind of has two sides it has the female side and the male side and the female side can't be channeled and the male one cannot and as a result this has generated a society that overall it's led by women because they can channel this power. They have been very powerful. They are not only the ones kind of like ruling with magic, but also the queen is there. And you know, meanwhile, the men, the ones that are able to channel this power will get mad. So it is very strange how in one hand, Robert Jordan gave this massive opportunity of power only for women, but at the same time, there's a little bit of commentary of, and when I mean a little bit, there's actually a lot of how, you know, how surprising it feels for our characters if a woman is doing something, how a certain character is bullying another, which will get there, and it feels weird. I know that this might change over time, and please, peer pressure me if you don't feel this is gonna be legit throughout the rest of the story, but it felt really weird. Anyway, we will follow to one of our main female characters. In this case, we have Egwene. She is another teenage in this village, and it seems that she and Ran has a little bit of an interest. Not like the TV series. They are not actually together. They are not. It seems that they you know, they're interested one in another, but they're not actually together. And you clearly see that because Egwene 
kind of like states rant i cannot stand your nonsense anymore but i also don't really love her i started really liking it and then there was a point in the story that it was the downfall for me with her and oh but then we have two female characters that i really adored in one hand we have Nynaeve she is the wisdom of this village and again as women are the only ones that are able to channel power in this case she is not properly channel that power because if you do that in the trained way you become an Aes Sedai which is this massive almost society of let's not say witches but they have power and each of them can have a Naja which is kind of like a division of how well what is going to be your orientation right like you can be a warrior you can be chasing bad men that are doing something with the power and becoming mad or you can be in politics you can be a justice things like that but this wisdom it's kind of like a pro she's able to detect how it's going to be the weather she can hear the wind talking she's basically powerful and then we also have more rain and she is amazing she is one of the Aes Sedai and it's one of the main characters that we will be following it seems that she and her warden Lan were also in two rivers they are kind of in a mission because it seems that the pattern of the wheel something is changing and she feels that there might be a dragon reborn a dragon reborn means that this terrible fight between the evil and the good it's about to be had again and we will have this male figure that it's supposed to be you know the good one fighting against this dark one that we saw at the beginning which of course it's Sauron and so basically Moraine knows that the pattern is changing and she's traveling to different villages and she sees that in this village there's a lot of things happening and you're seeing nothing because that night there's a massive attack from Trollocs or Orcs so they're basically this yeah not figure terrible bad ones that will be following our characters to no end throughout the whole book. There's going to be a quest from one place to another, passing through lots of inns and basically running away from these Trollocs and the figures that command them, these Nazguls of Way, which their name is, I think, Mirdal? Mordal? Mm. Anyway, that scene is phenomenal because we see how their descriptions, which I reckon there's a little bit a lot at the same time i was able to get into the perfect mood on how unsettled tam and rand are at this house tam decides to just take his sword from whatever place he had it hidden and this is important because this sword is going to be a trade from rand and he will love it no end and you know suddenly a trolloc appears they run tam it's hurt runs he's able to save his dad some way and he takes his dad to the center of the village where he discovers that trollocs have also attacked there it seems though that these trollocs have only attacked three places and the three places are the houses of these three young men so rand perrin and matt which is very suspicious and they are like but well hmm, something is wrong here but thankfully moraine and her warden lan who is one of the main characters that i absolutely love he is very powerful it's magical but at the same time he does not have magic but i feel he can heal quickly he tires less he is you know he is everything. As they were there, they were able to stop the massive fight and Rand goes begging Moraine to help his father. And, you know, she does. And that is something that will kind of like create this relationship between Rand and his friends and Moraine. That's kind of like the link. And together, they kind of see that it was very suspicious how there was only those three places that were attacked and Moraine now feels that one of these three characters is going to be the dragon reborn and unlike the feeling that I got in the tv series which for the whole season I was waiting for the dragon reborn to appear in the books you will get to see that everything links more towards Ran, who is going to be our main point of view anyway. But it's interesting because the eyes that I hear are seen as very powerful, but also very bad. So people are very fearful for them. And when Ran is asking Moraine for help for his dad, everyone's like, mm -mm, mm, 
you sure? Do you want to do that? Are you sure? And it is again interesting how Robert Jordan decided to use this massive potential and just taint it a little bit. It seems that the eyes that I fold from the perspective of the society because in one of these ages there were also male Aes Sedai. So both men and women were able to channel from the source of power, the female and the male one, but as every man gets tainted with the power, they went mad and there was this massive fight, they almost broke the world. So everyone is like, Aes Sedai, too much power, they can break things, we no likey. So it comes as a challenge for Moraine to ensure that everyone wants to run away because she's basically positive that Trollocs were there because of them, because they want to pick them up. Actually, one got to run and told him, I need you, you will get to see the Dark One, you will get to serve him. And he's like, no, I will not. Therefore, they are allying that yes, they're there because of them, and if they want to avoid following attacks, they need to run. So when they're about to go, they suddenly meet also Egwene, who is like, I will go with you guys because I won't skip this opportunity. She also is starting to train to be a wisdom and Moraine is like, mm, she might have power. So yes, I want her. And so with everyone now together, we start this amazing quest of them trying to go to Tar Valon, to Tar Valon? That's the place where they train, where they have everything. So it's kind of like, I feel in there we can do something and feel and protect you from the dark winds. But it's very far away, so lots of things will happen. And you know, as they are running, every time Lan is trying to inspect first the land, and Moraine it's always trying to ease how tired everyone is. The thing is that she cannot do something on herself. So if she's tired, she will need to suck it up and be tired herself. And no one really, you know, says thank you to her. All the time there are lots of uncertainty around her. There are things that are starting to happen to all boys, which are basically bad dreams, but they see this Sauron-like figure who is called Bahamoth. Balmoth? Bahamoth, and he's trying to take a boys, he's trying to bend them to his will, and they are like, should we tell this to Moraine? I guess not. She basically also tells them, if you start having dreams, let me know, I can help you, and they are like, but we are not gonna tell something to the Aes Sedai, and at some point I do understand this, because one, they are farm boys in the meaning of they have been very isolated for everything that they've known and the basic knowledge in this town is that the eyes that I are bad, that they have lots of power and basically with men it's messy because if you're able to channel power they are going to do something for you because you will go mad and they want to avoid that. So I reckon it's a little bit of a complicated situation but I don't feel she deserved that much uncertainty, that much jealousy around her doings, it felt really unfair and oh, but they really spent a lot of time running away, hiding and I just missed one of our most important characters, not important, but you really need to know this because we also have a golem here, which in this case is Panin Fane. He is a peddler and he was also in this town, it seems that he went to two rivers every year and he is kind of like friendly. We will see him following us throughout the whole journey. They won't necessarily see him, but he's gonna be there. He is our golem. Mine. So basically all our characters are chased by Trollocs and they finally get into our first inn within the city called Berlor. Berlon. It's the first time in which they can basically relax a little bit to think what was happening and also these dreams start to happen. There's something very interesting with how Robert Jordan wrote this book that I actually really enjoyed, which was that every time that our characters went to another setting, meaning, okay, we were on the road, now we are in an inn, then we're gonna be on the road again, then another inn, things like that, but in each of those scenes we get to know different piece of these massive world building. So we will get to see more about the powers in one of these 
moments. Then how the wheel turns in another. We will also get to know about the Children of Light, who is this society of people that really are against everything against the eyes and eye but also against the dark one so they're kind of like their own religion each of those pieces felt that added something to the story however i will say that there's a glossary while you end the book and that part which is just a paragraph to explain each of the things was more useful to me than the rest i understood things way more reading that glossary at the end that while I was picking up the bits and pieces of the story, really I thought it was stupid. I was like, man, I'm drinking so many piña coladas here. What is happening? Because I don't understand what is this horn, what is this bad one, what is the pattern, what is the... Too many words and yeah, eventually I picked them up, but they were there. And so if you're thinking, lady, if you're not picking this up, you better not read Malasan, you might be right. Mm, I might be in trouble there, but well, we will get to see eventually. They're trying to rest, but they find Padan Fane, and it really felt as a character that started being good, but then because of the power, he degraded, degraded, degraded until, you know, a golem. Basically, they're like, things are going bad, there are Trollocs coming, and then Nynaeve comes back. She's like, everyone, I'm coming with you. You guys cannot go alone. Let's go back to Two Rivers. No one told me that you were going because they kind of like escaped. And they are like, but no, Nynaeve, everyone is gonna die if we go there. And she's like, okay, fine, I will go with you then. So let's go. And everyone now, the team together, also with Thom, the Gleeman, starts this journey and more Trollocs are coming the way. There seems to be unavoidable. There's this almost dragon that it's also chasing them and they're like, man, something's going real bad. We're all gonna die here. And so Moraine takes this decision, which is mm, to go to this decrepit, ancient, crazy powerful but terrifying city called Shadar Logoth and it seems that not even the Trollocs go there so you might think Moraine lady maybe mm, it's not the best decision to go there but yeah well I take it you guys are desperate so they get into it and they're like wow everything is broken she and Lan are like don't touch anything everything is tainted things are bad here so please take that into consideration. And everyone is kind of like, okay, but at least it seems that we are gonna be fine for a little bit, which is a theme that will get repeated over and over again. Which again, one of the main things that for me was a little bit of a red flag, like things happen time and time and time again, as the wheel turned, like everything happened again. And they felt safe for a while. And you know, our, boys are feeling adventurous and they decide to go explore and they find this creature called Mordeth and he's basically Grima Wormtongue from Lord of the Rings and really this is the description that we get from him. So before Mordeth has been long in the city he had Balwin's ear and soon he was second only to the king. Mordeth whispered poison in Balwen's ear. Anyway, they don't know that, but it seems that this is kind of like a cool man and he's like, oh boys, can you maybe help me? I have this massive treasure and I need kind of help. And they're sounding like, mm, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm suspicious this is in the city not at all which again they are so naive there was a point in which i was like yes i get that you were sheltered but you also have common sense don't you they don't and they go to this place and he actually showed them this treasure which in my mind was always like the first scene in Aladdin with this treasure and you cannot touch something because if you touch anything then everything crumbles and they are like oh cool yeah for sure we will help you and they tell him that they are accompanied with an Aes Sedai and Mordeth gets crazy and he decides to kill them and then are running away like crazy and they manage to escape at the last second but when they reach the rest of our people or Moraine is like, okay, what? Did you find Mordeth? He was dangerous. And 
did you take anything that he gave you? Because everything in this land, it's poisoned. And everyone is like, no, 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 no. We did not take anything. But Matt did. However, Matt reasoning is kind of like, look, I did not take it from Morveth. I take it myself. So I guess there's a difference. So I will not say anything about it. I will just take this incredible dagger and just take it with me. So he, he is a little bit greedy and he just shush it up. He just keeps it from himself. He is like, everything's fine, but everything's not fine because this dark mist that surrounds this city at times, and it's very dangerous because if it touches, you die then starts to emerge. At the same time as the Trollocs start to invade also the city, it seems that not even this city that it's poisoned, it is stopping our Trollocs. So they're like on the flea, they are surrounded, and as a result, they are separated, which will start the worst part of the book for me. Incredibly boring. There were some points, but really, this could have been narrowed down in maximum 100 pages and then the ending was so incredibly rushed and it just oh, I am enraged about it. Nonetheless we will get to see in one hand how Egwene and Perrin escape. Up till this point I really enjoyed Perrin but having his point of view here because while they're separated we will get to see not only Rand's point of view but Rand in one hand then Perrin within this group and then we'll get to see Nynaeve who is the other group that are separated because basically we'll have Rand and Matt and we will have also Moraine, Lan and Nynaeve. So we will get lo lots of the scenes now of Perrin and Egwene just trying to hide feeling desperate because they don't know where the rest and Lucky for them, they will get to meet Elias, who is one of these characters who is truly fascinating. And it seems that he is able to talk, mind talk, with the wolves, which it's the best part I'm living for the wolves. And it seems that Perrin can also talk to them. And that is the part that I really love about Perrin. I love that he can speak with the wolves and I love that connection. I think it's fascinating. And Perrin's eyes start to be golden yellow. And Elias is like, tell me everything that has happened with you guys because I will help you. And they do. So he decides to accompany them for a while. But not not long after they will get to meet the traveling people which it's also called by the outside people as the Tinkers and they are this very hippie peaceful community and they leave the way of the leaf and it's basically doing peace never doing war and they're you know doing whatever they can and they are very welcomed not as much Elias but it seems that they have a story there and yeah basically Perrin will start to just think like mm, man I can feel the wolves meanwhile Egwene will get in one hand challenged lots of times by Perrin and this is the moment that I really hate him you will get to see five times throughout this part that Perrin feels that Egwene is bullying him for just speaking her mind telling him things as yeah, no, we are, we can share the horse. I'm not going to be the only one riding it or things like that. That is not the definition of bullying. And it really felt that one time maybe you can use that word like you're a friend and you're like, oh gosh, you're bullying me. But five times it felt really too much. And I saw that as a part of pairing, not really accepting woman speaking her mind. He respects, in a way, Egwene. He knows that she is powerful, uh, but at the same time, he is like, no, I don't like that. Egwene, for her side, uh, started really getting comfortable within this people, and she gets to know this man called Aram. And this is where I started to f not really like Egwene as much. Everyone here is like all cheerful, all lying, all dancing, and she basically spends her time, all of her time here with Aram, 
dancing. So Egwene's coping mechanism, it's dance, which is not bad in itself, but it felt a little bit plain for her, which again, still fine. This is not the point why with Egwene I had my downfall with her, but you know, it was fine up to this point. However, there's a little bit of tension between Perrin and Egwene, and Perrin cannot think more times Gosh, I wish I was like Rand. He really knows about girls. And man, this is a topic that will get repeated lots of times. It, it's ridiculous. Perrin will think multiple times, I wish I were Rand. He really knows about girls. And then Rand will think, gosh, I think I was like Perrin. He really knows about girls. And everything was like so very eye rolling to me. Like, Please. Anyway, they feel that something is going to change and they feel that they're putting in danger these traveling people because the Trollocs are following them. So they decide, Elias, the wolves, Perrin and Wayne, they decide to move away from these traveling people and they will get chased by ravens, which very weirdly was one of the best scenes for me. Like you get to feel like how anxious everything is. At some point, Egwene and Perrin got separated in one hand and in another, we'll get to see Elias and the wolves. And surprise, surprise, things will always happen to our characters and they will be faced with the children of light who they decide that the wolves are dark friends and that they need to die so you know the wolves kind of like try to defend themselves they kill someone children of light don't like that and they kill the wolf which was one of the saddest scenes of this whole book and basically Perrin goes mad and kills two people which support Perrin I like you because of that but still you need to move as a character long story short they get captured we move forward to the other point of view of Nynaeve, Moraine and Lan. Basically they do nothing beyond decide who of these boys we are going to be able to follow and it seems that they are on a path of finding pairing and basically this whole scene serves for us as a setting point for Nynaeve and Lan to have a romantic interest and this still comes very out of the blue but I loved it this is a ship that, like I'm shipping them I'm, I'm really shipping them yeah at some point they got to find Perrin and Egwene and they save them all of them save them so they are now together and running away again. They are decided to go to Camelin, which was the city that it seems everyone kind of like aligned. It's something happens. We need to go to Camelin, which is before Tarbalon, and we will, you know, we will meet there. So all the know that separately they need to go to this city in order to find themselves. And they are like, okay, let's go. If we have luck, we will find their Matt and Rand, which takes us to their perspective. And meanwhile, we'll get to see how Matt, Rand and Thom have escaped. They manage to, you know, just get into this ship where under the premise that they are apprentices from the Gleeman Thom. And he's actually very, like, I really liked it. I think he is our Gandalf. And I know our Gandalf should be Moraine, but Moraine feels more as our Arwen with powers, like she is very, you know, she's a she, she, oh, yeah, you know, that feeling, okay, so basically they start this non-stop Airbnb traveling now, they got experts at different inns, and the first one they got to White Bridge, and here we'll start to see how um, our characters are going to be chase down time and time and time and time again and how Matt slowly but surely descends into madness and one of these times they get attacked by trolls and Thom dies or it seems that he dies because mm, more stuff we will get to know about him later on. The last thing though that he says to them is like it's something happens to me uh, you need to go to the Queen's Blessing in Camelin and they're like okay got it so yeah He's dead, but they have a plan. And they start to gather this solo going to the Airbnbs and they try to do some gleaming work. And really this structure, it's very much the same. In each inn that they got, if there's a woman, this woman will always get to see Rand because Rand, you know, just 
incredible with women. And Rand's gonna be like, no, I don't know what to do. I wish I was as good as pairing with girls. Like, yeah, pairing is doing fine with Gwen. Anyway, eventually here, Rand discovers that Matt has this dagger and everything seems that the dagger is what it's getting Matt descend into madness. And that means actually that he's being very realistic. And he, yeah, he's bad, but I actually really like him in a way in which he felt like we're gonna die, you, you know, every, you, we cannot trust anyone. It's not that I like that part, but it felt realistic in a way. Although you can see that his thoughts are tainted from the beginning map. And you know, our Gollum will keep following our characters and they will get to see beggar here and there. Someone that is seeing them with dark intentions. And overall, we're discovering that there are lots of dark friends throughout this whole land. So this dark one who is supposed to be trapped, it seems that it's not as trapped or it seems that the trap, it's been weakened because there's also been uh, this wave of false dragons emerging through the later years, which means there's been men channeling the power from the source and, you know, eventually might be coming mad. And there's one that has been called the false dragon because the Aes Sedai say that this one, Loghain, it's not the good one, that it's, you know, a false, they need to stop him because he is about, you know, he is friends with the Dark One and things need to change. And basically they face this terrible situation, they move forward and eventually they get to Camelin. And in here we will get to, yeah, Queen's Blessing and upon arrival Rand will meet this incredible creature called Loyal. He is an ogre and it's my Gimli. Like, I know he is not a dwarf, he is an ogre, but oh, um, yes, the feeling, very similar. So it seems that he is part of this race, that they are the builders. They created amazing societies, amazing cities. But when the world broke because of this war with the male Aes Sedai, everything fell down and there are not so many stuff now. And these creatures are not coming back. But Loyal is like, well, I've always wanted to travel, I've read much, so I want to see the world for myself. But everyone is like, you look like a Trolloc, so we don't like you. And he's like, okay, fine, I will live within this library. Which, I mean, life goals, but at the same time, I'm sorry. And he is fantastic and he's like, Rand, I want to go with you. I feel that something is around you. Like, I get that feeling. Rand basically goes off and he is trying to see Loghain, this false dragon, because the Aes Sedai have got him and they've basically just displaying how they got him through the land, which I can see how these diminishes the will of any man touching the power of just going to the Aes Sedai and asking for their help because, you know, this is what will happen. Not cool. And while doing so, he will get to see again Padden Fane. He runs away because he doesn't know it's Padden Fane, but something weird happens. There's this natural creature also there and he kind of like runs away. He wants to be alone and trying to see Loghain in a peaceful little place. And so he kind of like climbs this wall and you know, he's like, he just falls into the gardens of the palace, which makes me think how high was that wall? Like how many meters was Rand able to climb? And that does not really seem like something that like, palace have, like you usually have something kind of like defend it. Anyway, he kind of lands very close to the princess and the prince, like how luck. And of course the princess is like, <laughs> Rand, I mean, you are kind of like, yeah, handsome. Um, and Ran is like, yeah, she is as well, but I just wish I was like Perrin. I roll, long story short, they get to the queen because everyone's like, why is this guy here? Queen decides to let Rand go, but the Aes Sedai that it's close to the queen actually prophesied that Rand is gonna be at the center of something in the wheel and that he is gonna play a massive role 
within this story. He runs away real fast, he goes back to the inn and the magic starts because it seems that there everyone is waiting. Moraine has been asking for Rand and Matt and they're like all together again which was incredibly great and also the biggest letdown ever because like everyone was like cool so now we're all together and I'm, again, this kind of like makes sense. All of them have been traumatized. They are still on the run, all of them. So yes, this makes sense, but it's basically like, oh, Rand, oh, Egwene, hug. Perrin is not saying anything. And very quickly, Moraine discovers that Matt is being poisoned by the dagger and she tries to cure him. And she is not able to detach him from the dagger. It seems that they have in some way created a dark bond, but she was able to shelter him for this powers in a way. So Matt gets slightly better and it seems that not all are bad news because Moraine also says the thumb might be alive and they're like, yay. But anyway, they start to talk and they discover that there's kind of like this prophecy that we've been seeing throughout these different parts of these perspectives in which not only our boys were having the dreams and in these dreams this sauron like creature was saying like you will rule for me you will ban for me you will you know do that for me and i will blind the eye of the world but it seems that there's these other people that have also said that the dark one is emerging that he will blind the eye of the world and moraine is like I the world? Okay, so now we need to change our path and go to the eye of the world, which it seems to be something which I did not understand until the end. It seems that there's power there and that it was kind of like a prison or one step of prison at least. I'm not sure even if I understood this. And it's been sheltered by this creature named the Green Man. And it seems that this is in this very dark place called the Blight, where there are these massive hounds of Trollocs. And they're like, okay, but we need to go there and destroy whatever happens at the eye of the world, which feels very much, let's go to Mount Doom and destroy the ring. And there's a problem here, which basically is how do we go to the eye of the world without being chased down and how the Trollocs have been moving without us noticing. And then Loyal says like, okay, wait, because there's actually something that we ogres used in the past, which are the ways. And these are kind of like portals that can allow you to travel, you know, like they're like wormholes. No one really uses this way gates anymore. Loyal is like, we should not use it though. And Moraine is like, no, but we should. And they go to this path and eventually they get into the caves of Moria. No, I mean into the ways. And so when they get in, they're basically seeing how these was created by the male power of the Aes Sedai. And as a result, these is a very tainted kind of power and the ways these caves have been, you know, just falling down throughout the years. And yeah, so they cross, they're terrified while doing so. And this is the scene in which Egwene and I, man, no. Great descriptions around how terrifying everything is. They are all very on edge, thinking the dark one, it's approaching. Moraine is starting to say that Rand, Perrin and Matt are kind of like tavern, which are kind of like at the center of the pattern of the wheel. Like the wheel weaves around them, like something happens with them and everything is very high stakes. And suddenly one of the names of these girls that Rand met gets popped and Egwene is like, but what? Who is that girl? And no, Ugh. I mean, no, Egwene, no. How are you playing the jealous one here when the stakes are so high? It's clear that none of you have time for doing anything. Again, this is like part of the commentary. This is really how women we should react, even if there's terrible terrible high stakes like should we be worried that our man it's meeting other women no i don't 
I don't feel so. But no worries, because Rand is like, this girl, I just talked with her once, which we are talking about Mean, one of the girls that he met at the beginning of the story when they were all together in the first inn that we ventured, and actually she is able to see visions, and she gave him a kind of like a prophecy. And he is like, but I talked to her once, she dressed like a boy, and her hair is as short as mine, which of course is reason enough for her not to be attractive, right? They start hearing monsters, they get the hell out of this place and, you know, they are alive, they are out, and yes, Pan and Fane, it seems to be also with them. Eventually, they get to Faldara, which is this fortress really close to the Blight, really close to the Eye of the World. And there we start to discover that Lan was actually a king, which, yes, I mean, he is a king of a destroyed kingdom, but he's basically kind of like this promised heir. And if he eventually wants to retake his throne of no one, because again, city destroyed by Trollocs, like the people wants him, that's the footnote. People wants him, I want him, he deserves the best thing in the world. And then they meet Achelmar. Agelmar, who is kind of like ruling this fortress and soon after we discover that Pan and Fane has been seen and trapped and Moraine starts to interrogate him and this is the point where we get to see that he was chasing them throughout every step of the way, that he was actually the one that put the Trollocs on the feet and he has been changed by the Dark One. He has been tortured and he is now the Hound. He's able to feel who has this power, which out to this point you already see is Rand. They are all like, no, he was the one that ensured that the Trollocs came into two rivers. I cannot believe it. And everyone is just shocked. Nonetheless, they need one night sleep because next day they're going to the eye of the world and in that night Nynaeve's not able to sleep and she kind of like decides that it's the last chance that she has to speak with Lan and you know sad because they each love each other but Lan is like I cannot be with you because you know I am nothing. And I am like, no, you are everything. And Nynaeve is the same. So from that point onwards, things will get really cold. Next day, they decide to go to the eye of the world. They need to cross the Blight, which is this very hot, forgotten and full of dark creatures place, searching for the Green Man. It seems that the eye of the world and the Green Man changes. It just comes with the need. And yeah, they need it. So eye of the world appears real fast. And... It seems that there's a pool of untainted power of Satan. So this is the male part of the power, and it was created by all of these male Aes Sedai long time back. And it seems that it is untainted. So you can touch it, you can channel it, and not necessarily go crazy, but you know, rest of the power that men can touch, it's tainted by the dark one, which really made me think why we are expecting to defy the Dark One with another man. You know, if the power is female and male, and the Dark One has the male side, and we have always been trying to fight this with other male just getting into this power, I wonder why we're not trying to think that maybe women and men, good men, can go against the Dark One. Well. I don't know, like, you, you let me know if you've read it or, or not, if it's something that I need to discover. And Moraine just brings everyone here because she's like, okay, something's gonna happen. Now you guys are at the center of the world at this point and we will discover who of you is powerful. At this point, we discover that these two dark friends that were supposed to be not there, they are, they're very bad, they're very powerful. One of them gets killed by the green man, but the other one kills the green man, which is very sad because he was this tree kind of character and he was very wholesome, to be honest. It felt a little bit unfair, but yeah, good scene. So we get to this last contender from the darkness and Rand suddenly discovers that he is the one that can channel this power and he starts to channel it and he kills this dark creature. But things 
don't end there. He is kind of like super empowered with power. I don't know how, but he's able to travel to part of the Blight where there were lots of Trollocs and to decimate that army that was fighting with the army of Faldara at that point. And if you're feeling that this part of the ending, it's more rushed, it's not just me explaining it rushed, it's that it was rushed in the book. It was rushed. And I'm still not able to understand why Rand was able to do that. Everything was very vague for me. At some point, Sauron, I mean Baal Thamon, appears as well. And Rand kind of like sees this dark, energy court that it's connected to this figure and he sees also like a, da a bright side and he's kind of like able to savor that court with his sword that was his father's but it's kind of like full with light and it feels as if this dark creature has died but at the same time it kind of feels as if we have just liberated from something that got it connected don't we feel this a little bit but whatever there were some comments here that i really loved about rand and just made me have the faith restored with him and he's saying to ma althamon there are all the choices the wheel weaves the pattern not you ever trap you're late for me i have escaped i've escaped your fates your trollocs escaped your dark friends I tracked you here and destroyed your army on the way. You do not weave the pattern, which was so very epic. And yes, I loved it. So, well, yeah, long story short, they go out and only Nynaeve, Egwene, Moraine and Lan knows that Ran is the one that can channel this power. Ran is very scared because he now feels that he will go mad and he decides to not tell anything to our main characters. And so basically what we have, it's now kind of like this section in which they have found that the eye of the world has been drained and at the bottom there were three different objects. In one hand we have a horn which is able to command an army. Then we also have a banner of the dragon, the last dragon, and we also have a seal that seems to be broken. And you know, they are like, okay, we now need to go to Tarvalon, we need to cure Matt, Egwene and Nynaeve will start to train to be Aes Sedai and you know, Perrin also benefits because he wants to go there and Rand decides to not only not tell Perrin and Matt that he was the one with powers but also he is not going with them. He has discovered that he needs a little bit of space for himself to think which I completely respect and we basically end this story with more rain saying okay the dragon has been reborn which yay very epic yeah this is basically the story let me know let me know like what do you feel and if there's something that i take from it again it's how great the stakes were i love the chosen one i i'm fearful from some scenes but i really want to read book two it took me 70 percent of the book to get engaged but then i'm really in for it one thing that i really loved was how the community was really supportive with me so i i love that experience of reading something that it's loved by lots of people and people were asking it felt really kind of like the reason why i got into booktube so I loved it. Let me know. Did I made it? Like, do you feel messy? But kind of like, yeah, hell, this is a good story. Well, let me know. Bye.